Hello everyone, thanks for coming along. Let me introduce the topic of my talk with a familiar observation about the use of the truth predicate as an expressive device. When A says that Aristotle is the teacher of Alexander the Great, and B says that's true, false, or not true, then what B asserts or denies is the very same thing than what A asserts, even though it might seem that they're talking about different things, seeing that A is talking about the relationship between Aristotle and Alexander, and B is talking about A's statement, or the thought expressed by the statement. Now, a familiar explanation of why A and B are talking about the same thing goes like this. The truth predicate serves, as it were, to point through the sentence to the reality. It serves as a reminder that those sentences are mentioned, reality is still the whole point. To call something true is not to make a comment on a statement or a judgment, to evaluate it. It is simply to express a certain thought and to assert it. Now, there's certainly something right about that, but perhaps at the expense of a different and equally now established intuition. And it certainly seems that sometimes our truth talk is concerned with substantive properties of representational states and acts. Certainly when we talk of truth as the aim or norm of assertion, as a standard of correctness for judgment and assertion and so on. However, it seems that when we call something true, we do sometimes comment on and evaluate the statements as correct or incorrect. Moreover, it seems that the two uses of the truth predicate, the expressive and the commenting function, evaluative function, often go together, typically in the use of the truth predicate for the expression of agreement and disagreement. So in the previous example, when A asserts that P and B says that's true, then B seems to be doing several things at once. She expresses a proposition and she asserts, but she also comments on A's statement and evaluates it as correct. And my aim for the talk uh, is to sort of propose a reversal of perspective. Instead of saying that A and B are talking about the same thing, because talk about truth is really just talk about the underlying reality and nothing else, I want to suggest that they're talking about the same thing because predicating truth is always included in predicating anything whatsoever. I call this idea the omnipresence of truth. Of course, this raises the question, what does it mean? The truth is included, and what is it included in? And how does it help with the previous observations? And let me begin with a quote from Gottlob Frege, a prominent defender of the idea, which will serve as a negative foil in order to introduce certain questions that will structure the rest of the talk. In this paper on the thought, Frege writes, it is worth noting that we cannot recognize a property of a thing without at the same time finding the thought that this thing has this property to be true. So with every property of a thing is conjoined the property of thought, namely that of truth. It is also worth noting that the sentence, I smell the scent of violets, has just the same content as the sentence, it is true that I smell the scent of violets. So it seems then that nothing is added to the thought by my ascribing to it the property of truth. There are several questions about this passage. I will mention three. First is whether OT, so omnipresence of truth, applies to thought propositions or rather to mental states, speech acts, and the like. The second is whether the content of A is the same or different from the content of it is true today. The third and finally, what, if anything, does truth add to our thoughts? I'll be very brief with the first question and just uh, assume that the scope of the omnipresence thesis goes hand in hand with the question about the fundamental bearers of truth. So, for example, Frege thinks that the fundamental truth bearers are propositions, or what he calls thoughts, the content of declarative sentences relative to context, objects of attitude such as hope, belief, desire, and so forth. And according to Frege, Frege the content of the omnipresence thesis is contained in the identity between the proposition today and the proposition that it is true that A. 
This is the identity view of the OT. I'm going to defend a different view, but I will stick with the assumption that the scope of OT just goes hand in hand with the questions about the various of truth. Turning to, turning to the second issue, the considerate, the most important consideration in favor of the identity between the cons and A, the cons and that it is true that A is the transparency between A and it is true that A. They are at least necessarily equivalent, possibly stronger. The strongest possible uh, equivalence would be identity of contents. It is instructive to compare truth with a similar case, namely that of being or existence. David Hume, in the inquiry concerning human understanding, writes, to reflect on anything simply and to reflect on it as existent are nothing different from each other. That idea, so the idea of existence, when conjoined with the idea of any object, makes no addition to it. In a famous passage from the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant expresses a similar idea. Towards the end of his critique of the ontological argument for the existence of God, he writes, being is obviously not a real predicate, i.e. a concept of something that could add to the concept of a thing. It is merely the posting of a thing or of certain determinations in themselves. And perhaps the deflationary stance towards truth can be captured in a similar stone. I might say, truth is not a real predicate, i.e. the concept of something that could add to the content of a thought. It is merely an expressive device. On the other hand, there are a number of considerations that militate against the identity of concept considered proceedings like and adopted by Frege. For example, there seems to be uh, an asymmetry between the claim that it's true that P and the claim um, that P. Well, it seems that it's true that snow is white because snow is white, but not vice versa. If you don't find that intuitively plausible, it might um, help to change the example slightly. It's true to say, judge, or assert that snow is white because not is white, but not the other way around. Secondly, there are several data from anaphoric reference that seem to suggest that the propositions are different. So starting with sentence number one, to hold up. Um, in the first conjunct, the property of being foolhardy is attributed to Mary. The adjective is picked up in the second conjunct and the property is attributed to Mike. Very similar, it seems, in the second sentence, the property of the truth is attributed to Mary's statement, which is picked up in the second conjunct and attributed to Mike's statement. Moreover, in the third sentence, in the second conjunct of the third sentence, something is picked up in the second conjunct from the first, and the only candidate is the truth predicate. So it seems that the property of truth is attributed to something noted by the phrase that violets are blue. Whether that something is a proposition, a statement, a judgment, an attitude, an object, or something else is another question. Finally, if saying that violets are blue were really just a way of calling violets blue as quine things, then three should be equivalent to four. But clearly that's not the case. So, I don't mean to suggest that any of these considerations are conclusive, I don't think they are, but I think they go some way towards showing that it might be preferable to sort of, um, try to um, um, try to address both sets of intuitions and considerations, depending on your background and your background beliefs and assumptions, um, you might find different considerations more or less plausible. Turning to the third and last question, what, does, what, if anything, does truth add to our thoughts? I want to begin with another um, quote from Frege. In a posthumously published note um, on his logic, he writes, the word true seems to make the impossible possible. It allows what corresponds to the esoteric force to assume the form of a contribution to the thought. And although this attempt miscarries, or rather to the very fact that it miscarries, it indicates what is characteristic of logic. I want to focus on the first part of that quote. As is well known, Frege distinguishes between content and force. 
at least in his early writings, he uses a dedicated device to indicate the presence of esoteric force, namely the so-called judgment strip, represented by seeing the turnstile, which indicates that what that the sentence to the right is to be taken with esoteric force rather than as merely entertained. It seems that the vernacular um, has a number of devices that could fulfill a similar function. For example, predicates like is a fact or is true. And one might get to conclude that the truth predicate is a conventional device that can serve at least some of the functions that the artificial stipulated judgment stroke serves, namely that of signaling asteroid force. Frege rejected this idea for considerations that are summed up under the circle of Frege at each point. To give you some idea, if the truth predicate occurs in the antecedent of a conditional, so if we say, if it is true that Epimedes was killed at the capture of Syracuse, then such and such is the case, and the antecedent is not certain, although the truth predicate is present. This is one of the crucial differences between the artificial device, the judgment stroke, and the truth predicate, because the former cannot be embedded. Nevertheless, I think these considerations are conclusive. And in fact, I'm going to suggest that something in the vicinity um, of this idea can in fact be defended. So um, to sum up and write an outlook for the rest of the talk, I distinguish between two conceptions of the omnipresence thesis of truth. The first is the identity view, the which is defended by Frege and recently by Yaman Asai, according to which truth is a feature of propositions. The proposition that A is identical to the proposition that it's true that A, and truth adds nothing to content. On the explicative conception of the omnipresence thesis, as I call it, truth is a feature of utterances or acts of assertion. Truth is included in every assertion in the sense that to assert is to acknowledge as true. And the proposition that A, the proposition that it is true that A are different. Let me start with the first point that truth is a feature of utterances or acts of assertion rather than sentences or propositions which are merely true or false relative to various parameters, in particular to uh, topic situations. This is a highly controversial um, topic, and I can't begin to, um, I can't really explain, let alone defend the idea in detail. Um, but to give you um, some idea at the, the problem and the options in the vicinity to situate my view, we start with a familiar example from Bowers and Etchemendy, the book on the liar paradox. They write, we might imagine that there are two card games going on, one across town from the other. Max is playing cards with Emily and Sophie, and Claire is playing cards with Dana. Suppose someone watching the former game mistakes Emily for Claire, and claims that Claire has the three of clubs. She would be wrong on the Estinian account, even if Claire had the three of clubs across town. But the Estinian account that they're talking about is just this view that sentences or propositions are just topic sensitive, true or false relative to particular situations, whereas the utterance or acts of assertion are true or false simpliciter. So it is tempting uh, in this example to say that the proposition that class the three of clubs is really true, but the utterance of the sentence infelicitous in this particular conversational setting, call this invariantism, to make this position slightly less um, likely, one can change the example for example, by letting Claire play two card games simultaneously on a computer. In that case, it really seems arbitrary to insist that the proposition that Claire has the three of clubs is true or false simplicity, because we can't decide which it is. Of course, maybe there's no need to choose. If you are old and experienced staring down in character of the stairs, you might just say there's no need to choose. As a matter of objective fact, the proposition is true or false, even if there's no way to tell which it is. That's roughly the line taken by Capellan and Lepore, but it's not terribly popular, I think. Um, another option is sort of a certain kind of relativism. Relativism are the sentences and the semantic contents 
which are only true of words relative to situation, whereas the utterance are true of words in visita. Still another option is contextualism, according to which the content of an utterance uh, of Claire has the three of clubs in a particular content is the proposition that she has those cards in this or that particular game, and that proposition is true of words simpliciter. I put relativism and contextualism in scare quotes because the terminology here is contested um, and a bit of a mess. Some people would deny that uh, what I call relativism here is really relativism, uh, but I don't want to go into that because it's not terribly important. Finally, there are those who distinguish between different notions of content, semantic content, which is compositionally determined and true or false only relative to situations whereas the assertory content contains information about the topic situation and is true of all simpliciter. That is, incidentally, the position taken by Bauer is actually himself. And briefly, um, in regards to, context to contextualism, um, what I disagree with is that um, what is true of all simpliciter for me are representational acts and states. Um, acts of judgment, assertion, um, belief, and so forth, not their contents, which determine uh, conditions of correctness. On the other hand, um, a popular objection to relativism is that it makes impossible a stable evaluation of assertion or judgment as correct or incorrect. Now, while I don't know if this objection is really conclusive, I do find it uh, unattractive that the bearers of absolute truth are sort of relegated um, outside the realm of semantics, whereas the contextualist example, has propositions which stand in logical relations um, to, to, to other things. And so what I like, what I'd like is to adopt the relative with the view that only utterances are true or simplista by conceiving of them in such a way that they can be taken uh, stand in logical relation to other things. Now, the starting point of my idea is to deny an assumption that's common to relativism, contextualism, and to most other um, options in the vicinity, namely the assumption that assertion is a relation between speaker and a proposition, or a relation between a speaker, a proposition, and a topic situation. Instead, I suggest to think of assertion as a token reflexive act that presents itself as true to the facts with regard to some particular topic situation. So, an assertive utterance of Theotetus as flying will represent Theotetus as flying in virtue of presenting itself, the very utterance of the sentence, as true to the facts with regard to some particular situation. So assertions are particular datable acts which display conventional signs that indicate that they are intended to reflect the commitment of the speaker to take the facts about a particular situation as the ground of their utterance. But I want to, don't want to leave it at that. Instead, I want to represent this idea of assertion in a way that facilitates integration um, with uh, other parts of semantic and logical theory. In particular, I want to represent it in semantic terms. Now, I'm going to say a bit more about what I mean by that, what I mean by representing assertion in these terms. For the moment, um, um, let it be enough to say that um, just as we can represent and therefore capture certain aspects of meaning in terms of the theory of truth conditions of declarative sentences, so it is my idea we can also represent certain aspects of assertion and assertory practice in terms of a particular kind of self-referential sentence and a particular kind of truth conditions. So these are the two elements that we need. I'm going to introduce that in turn, starting with to begin with two very simple and familiar examples, the liar and the truth teller. The liar asserts uh, its own falsity of itself. The truth teller asserts truth of itself. By a familiar reasoning, the assumption that the liar is true allows us to conclude that it is false, whereas the assumption that it is false allows us to conclude that it is true. On the other hand, the assumption that the truth teller is false uh, allows us to stay with the assumption that it is false. And the assumption that it is true um, and as to conclude that it is true. So, in the case of the liar, both assumptions are somehow problematic, whereas in the case of the truth teller, both assumptions are harmless, but the choice between the two seems to be arbitrary. 
Turning to a more interesting case, I call sentences like row, snow is white and row is true, hybrid truth teller sentences. Why? Because on the one hand, row is like the, the ordinary truth teller. Because even if snow is white, the first conjunct is true. The entire sentence could be false, but neither true nor false because of the second conjunct. On the other hand, it is unlike the truth teller because if snow is white, so the first conjunct is false. And the entire sentence cannot be true. So it seems that we can distinguish between uh, at least three classes of types of sentences. Sentences in the first class are fully grounded in non semantic facts. Sentences like snow is white, or snow is not white. Sentences in the second class are completely ungrounded, independent of non semantic facts. Sentences like the lamp tower of towns, the liar, and the truth teller. Finally, Sentences in the third and most interesting group are constrained but not grounded, so hybrid truth tellers like Rob. There may be uh, other types of sentences, um, so the classification into three classes is not meant to be exhaustive, but I'm not going to talk about that since because it doesn't matter in the present context. So with that we have the first element, namely self-referential sentences, let me turn to the second, and then special truth conditions or directed truth conditions, which I'm going to introduce in two steps because there are two senses of direction involved. First idea is to evaluate truth with respect to non-semantic facts. So consider a hybrid truth term like five. If you try to evaluate five on the grounds of an ordinary T schema, we won't get a definitive verdict because of the second conjunct. However, if we evaluate it in terms of a modified T schema, like T tells us that truth descriptions are true just in case the sentence is true about the non-semantic facts, we will get a def definitive verdict. Because five will be true just in case the first conduct is true, otherwise not. Okay. So the evaluation of truth descriptions involves a restriction to a subset of facts rather than to understanding truth. We can't make it um, with non-semantic facts alone, but we can use them for certain purposes such, such as these. But in the second step, we evaluate truth with respect to non-semantic facts concerning particular situations. So consider another hybrid truth, in this case six, um, which asserts true of itself with respect to some particular situation. And consider another modified T schema, this time for um, a relative truth ascription that says that A, um, that is true that A of S is true just in case the sentence A is true about the non semantic facts concerning the situation S. In this case, in T star, there are two notions of aboutness of or directedness, which can be clarified with a familiar example. If A says that A that Claire has the three of clubs, we might take her to be talking about Claire's poker hands, or equivalently, which cards she has in her hands, or we might take her to be talking about the card game. The first corresponds to the notion of um, true about the non-semantic facts. The second one corresponds to the notion of true concerning a particular situation. Okay, so now we have all the elements in place. The idea, of course, is to represent the assertion of a sentence like Clee, Claire has the three of clubs, in terms of a hybrid truth term sentence like six, and evaluate it in terms of directed truth conditions as represented in T star. So let me give you two examples, starting with a very simple one. The A, who says that Claire has the three of clubs, Says that Claire does not have the three of clubs. The proposal is that we can represent the assertion that A makes in uttering this sentence with seven. Claire has the three of clubs, and this very sentence is true of some particular situation X, where we can represent B's assertion with eight. So what A asserts and B denies, namely that Claire has the three of clubs, is true or false relative to different topic situations. But whether A and B agree or disagree depends not only on what they assert, 
but whether they assert or deny the same thing of the same situation. Second example is slightly more involved. Consider a dialogue between A and B about the weather. A says it's raining, B says that's true. Let's assume that A is talking about the weather in New York, say, whereas B is talking about the weather in Melbourne. So we can represent A's assertion with nine and B's assertion in terms of 10. Now the truth condition for the assertion uh, that A makes is pretty straightforward because nine is going to be true just in case it is raining at X. But the truth condition for 10 are slightly different. Because for 10 to be true, it must be the case that it's raining at Y. It must also be the case that it is raining at X. So the example is meant to illustrate two points. First, um, the distinction between the expressive and the commenting function of the truth predicate. So in the beginning of the talk, um, I, I pointed out that some people think the truth predicate has merely an expressive function. It serves to express certain thoughts or contents. It is never used to comment on or evaluate something. I pointed out that sometimes the expressive and commenting function of the truth predicate seem to go hand in hand, in particular if the cases where truth predicate is used to express agreement or disagreement. Sometimes, however, they can come apart, as it is in the present case where A, uh, where A and B are talking about different things. B doesn't, in, say, in asserting that's true with regards to A's um, statement that it's raining, B doesn't just um, assert the very same proposition that A asserts. He expresses the proposition that it's raining and asserts it for a particular situation to be why, but he also makes a comment on A's statement and evaluates that as true. A second point is the content of the uh, respective assertions. Um, in my picture, the content of the assertion um, that it's raining, the content of the assertion that that's true, what that refers to um, the assertion that it's raining are different. That's because, again, the um, content of B's assertion is richer than that of A's. The A merely asserts the proposition that it's raining of some situation. B does that too, but in addition makes a comment on A's assertion. If all goes well and the two parties talk about the same thing, so if they talk about the same situation, then the difference won't be noticeable. And both will be true if and only if it is raining at the particular situation under consideration. But in some cases, they, the two can come apart, as in this, when they're talking about different uh, situations. So to sum up, in my, uh, in my view, um, the content of the assertion that it, it's raining and the content of the assertion that it's true, it's raining, are different, or more generally, the content of the assertion today, the content of the assertion that is true today. Okay, let me say a few things about what I mean that we can represent um, a model assertion in terms of these self-referential sentences and directed truth division. Because clearly people don't go about pronouncing these sentences. Nor do I mean to suggest that um, speakers um, certain mental operations that they undergo perhaps unconsciously, something like that. So what do I mean? By way of comparison, consider the representation of procedural knowledge or know-how in terms of declarative knowledge such that, such as the representation of the practical ability to type the computer in terms of the theory describing the layout of the keyboard, or the representation of meaning and semantic competence considered as a practical ability in terms of a truth conditional meaning theory for a particular language. The suggestion is not that people who have the ability to type at the computer have internalized the theory describing the layout of the keyboard, or that competent speakers of English have internalized a truth conditional meaning theory for English. Rather, the suggestion is that knowledge of a theory describing the layout of a keyboard would enable someone to perform at least some of the actions 
but a person with the ability to type at the keyboard would be able to form them, hitting the right keys. Similarly, knowledge of a truth conditional theory of meaning would enable someone to perform some of the actions that are facilitated by competence in the language, drawing inferences, um, making judgments about compatibility and incompatibility of various claims, and so forth. And in this sense, it is in this sense that I want to understand the fact that assertion can be represented in terms of particular kind of self referential sentence. Just as we can um, represent and hence capture at least some aspects of meaning and semantic competence in terms of truth conditions for declarative sentences, so the idea we can represent and hence capture at least some aspects of assertion and assertory practice in terms of a particular kind of self referential sentences and directed truth conditions. Before I end, let me briefly compare the preceding ideas with um, views that have some similarity. Um, so the first person that comes to mind is David Lewis, who denies that beliefs are relations between thinkers and proposition, propositions, and instead thinks that beliefs are self-attributions of properties. For example, to believe that snow is white is not to stand in the belief relation to the proposition that snow is white, Rather, it is to ascribe to oneself the property of living in a world where snow is white. Lewis thinks that self descriptions of uh, properties are the basic case, and descriptions of properties to other things are a special case. Roger Chisholm defends a similar view, both that declarative utterances express properties of speakers, namely the properties of accepting certain states of affairs. Finally, John Perry is another example thinks that the contents of linguistics and expressions in general um, encode their application conditions, for example, the contents of declarative sentences that encode truth conditions. I don't really talk much about these uh, or at all. I don't talk at all in the, the paper that I submitted about um, these, these examples, and I haven't really thought them through, but I would be interested to hear in suggestions about what, what, what people think about uh, how um, ideas relate to that. Okay. Let me briefly um, sum up. Um, I've distinguished between two conceptions of the omnipresence theory of truth. The first is the identity view of OT defended by Frege and recently by Kamil Asai, according to which truth is a property of thoughts or propositions, the proposition that A is identical to the proposition that it is true that A and truth as nothing to the content of thoughts or assertions and the like. According to the explicative conception of OT that I defend, truth is primarily a feature of acts of assertion. Assertions are reflexive acts which present themselves as true with respect to particular situations. Truth descriptions make explicit what is contained in assertive utterances, namely the acknowledgement of truth. And finally, the proposition that A is not identical to the proposition that it is true that A. And that is it from my side. Thank you.